Against your little fucking pussy. Oh fuck, baby, get on top of me. Get up here. Oh, oh fuck me. Welcome oh. to episode seventy something oh. of that thing with James J. Asher the oh. second. I'm your host, oh, James J. Asher the second, joined by my quarantine co-host, oh. Emily. Coming to you live from Fuckfest, Austin, Texas. That's a guy fucking a uh, latex torso. Yeah, that's something. Wow, he's really getting into that thing. He's doing it in his car, too. That is disgusting. Is he going to blow? How loud is it going to be? Oh, Jesus. Take that fucking dick. Take that fucking dick right fucking there. Oh. 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 oh, baby. Oh. oh, shit. Oh, my God, you're so fucking sexy. Now, today's theme is Nazis. That was wild. Uh, yeah. Today's theme is the Nazis. How do you feel about that? Uh, not so great about them. About the Nazis? Yeah. Uh, so... Today we're talking specifically about... I, I, I don't know how any other... I mean, that dude just blew his load in a latex torso. Yeah, I'm still confused as to how that... How, what's confusing about it? He jismed into a latex torso. Oh, I mean, I saw that. I saw a little too much. Um, we did say, see his balls. Yeah, they looked like brains. <laughs> we used to, well, we, uh, this kid Shane on the, on the band bus used to do this thing called monkey brains where he'd like tap you on the shoulder and you'd look over and he'd have his, uh, testicles like bulging out from his fist like you know he, he got the fist around like the uh the tubes that go down to the balls yeah he got that and then uh you know squeezed it, the scrotum real taut and would put it in your face he wouldn't touch your face with it although i'm sure he wanted to but he'd put it in your face and scream monkey ball or monkey brains not monkey balls <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as someone that grew up with six brothers, I'm going to say that's disgusting, but unsurprising. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, so uh, today we are talking about... Let's just jump right in. I don't, I don't have any other <laughs> intro. Um, occultism in Nazism. Were you aware that some people within the Nazi party, were into the occult. Uh, a little bit, but before research, I didn't know how much so. What did you know before research? Uh, that there was some weird sort of occultism like going on, that's all I knew. Just that it existed. That it existed? Mm -hmm. Do you remember where you may have heard no. this existed? You just It was kind of general knowledge to you? Yeah. Okay. And I also thought that there were some weird things going on with, like, the twin tests and everything else that happened. What the fuck are the twin tests? Oh, trust me, we'll talk about that uh, in a, probably in the future episode. Okay. Yeah, which brings us to a good point. Um, I'm not sure how many episodes this is going to be, but this is a multi-episodic subject. Um, I originally intended this just to be a one-episode thing about a, a Nazi occultism. But uh, when I started researching it, I very quickly discovered that it is a deep, multifaceted, very fucking insane topic. And there's a lot to talk about. And some of it links to current affairs. Relevance. It's relevant. 
So this is going to be a multi-episodic series called New Age Nazis. Oh, wow. No, okay, so here are... So we took some notes. Um, Emily helped me with researching this, and she's going to continue helping me research this, whether she knew it or not, uh, because there's more to research. Um, uh, we have compiled, I feel, enough information to get this ball rolling. So, uh, do. So I, I wrote, some, we, we've got some notes and they're not super organized. She's better at organizing notes, but she didn't really organize these. Um, and I was thinking like, maybe we could do it chronologically because it just makes more sense because the shit that happens for the reasons they happened or, and why they happened are so far beyond any sane logic or reason uh, to use the parlance of Ben Shapiro. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, with facts and logic, that the Nazis did not care about facts and logic other than their own. They created alternative facts and they used that a lot. Although it wasn't just the Nazis. These uh, quote-unquote alternative facts that uh, the Nazis founded a lot of their uh, horrific and fucking bizarre practices and beliefs off of, um, a lot of the rationale behind the stuff started a couple hundred years. I mean, I'm sure it goes back to the beginning of, you know, the fucking amoeba turns into a fish, turns into a amphibious creature, turns into a human. Uh, but for the purpose of this, I think, well, actually one part, I will have to go back to medieval times when I get into the, um, uh, order of the Thule or something like that. There's the Thule society. And then there's the order of the Thule. Although I may be mixing up my terms here, but that goes back to the middle ages. But for this episode, we're just going back, uh, to about the 18th century. That's the 1700s for you plebeians. Um, but first, I've got some notes. Uh, let me read them to you. And, and, and please bear with us as these notes are kind of scattered, but they exist. So we're, we're just going to go with the flow, uh, like I like to do. I hate having plans for the day. I like to have like a general idea of what's going to happen. But if it's like you got to be here and then here and then here, like unless it's a gig, like unless I'm getting paid for it, um, I, you know, if it's just my day or or a day with friends, I, I don't want to break it down that much. Well, anyway, I first encountered the idea that Nazis were at least somewhat invested in occult research and practice was via the video game Wolfenstein, uh, the series, um, the movie, the uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, who is that? Indiana Jones movies. Um, and also if, in one of my favorite literary series, the Illuminatus trilogy, written by Robert Anton Wilson and Robert Shea. Holy shit, I can't believe I just remembered that name. I have read the book a couple times. Well, Trilogy, it's f it's phenomenal. I highly recommend it. It takes, like, all, uh, all fucking conspiracy theories and puts them into one book in one giant psychedelic uh, noir mystery satire. It's great. Well, anyway, that's where I first encountered the idea of, like, a cult in the Nazi party. Well, uh, so here, let me continue reading. While the stories and the idea that the Nazis engaged in occultism was entertaining, it did not occur to me then that the concept was anything other than fiction. Years later, when I was in grad school, Two years, which I spent thoroughly and consistently steeped in straight liquor, I came across a video on YouTube which introduced me 
to the idea of Nazi mysticism and occultism uh, and the idea that it, it wasn't just fiction. It was an actual practice for them. And one of the things I learned about was this, um, the hollow earth theory, which we will get to later when we kind of break down um, some of Hitler's beliefs or, or supposed beliefs. Um, but again, for this episode, we're just laying the, we're, we're setting the scene, building the foundation. So you have some context to understand what the fuck. Okay. So, uh, let's see here. Where should we start? I think we should maybe start with the, um, the unification of the Volkish movement because that's kind of yeah that's kind of where it preempted the uh, the Nazi party yeah so so there are these things called world wars I know nothing about that you don't know anything about world wars never well I mean I don't know all the details so it would help if you knew a bit too (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I I know that they happened. What do you need to know about World Wars? Um, how many of them have there been to date? Two. You have ish. to think about that. Two World Wars. Ish, yeah. What do you say, ish? Uh, there are some that maybe could be like signs, but no. You mean a, the signs of a potential third World War? Yeah. Well, that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking what's actually happened, Two. not what may. Two. Um, and so the First World War happened, what, 19 teens, 1917 or 14? I, f- I forget which. Before uh, the Spanish flu, which was 1918, right? Speak up. Before the Spanish flu, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, just barely. Yeah, because it was believed, it's rumored that the Spanish flu was started from uh, all the corpses soldiers coming back with it. R- like spreading right, it Right, the spread mm-hmm. came. And they blamed it on the French. Which, it's so weird that we call it the Spanish flu, where today, that would be like saying, by the same logic, that would be like saying um, the Chinese virus. Yeah, fun fact about it. Supposedly, it's linked to Kansas. <laughs> a COVID-19? No. The Spanish flu? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's the big theory going on right now. That it was in... It started in Kansas? Yeah. Brought back from a military member. So, there was this thing called World War One. Yes, there was. Um, and basically... What it was were just a bunch of capitalist powers fighting over colonies and resources and who could piss further than the other. Because as we all know from Karl Marx, history is nothing but class struggle. And this was a struggle the both world wars really essentially well especially world war 1 as far as i understand it uh let me just set this let me just set this straight um this is an entertainment show skewing towards comedy so although this is a history lesson on a sort of niche subject um do not presume that I know everything about what we're talking about. So let me just say, all the stuff, uh, historical things that both of us are about to say, are you a historian? No. Neither of us are historians. However, we did actually put in energy and do our due diligence to research the subject. Um, And so what we are presenting in this series is, underline this, to the best of our understanding yeah so uh if you've ever seen any podcasts that i've been in where there's historical talk i don't know that much about it i just study it sometimes and then you know look it up look up some facts 
Yeah. So, um, if, if you know more about the history of this, um, you know, comment on my social media or something or, or go watch this on YouTube for you listeners, go watch it on YouTube, go to the comments and set the record straight. Although history is a debate. It's a constant debate. The victor writes the story. Right. It's the story. Um, but, you know, so don't, don't like at me calling me a fucking moron for getting the thing wrong. Because I just said, underlined, to the best of our understanding. Um, do, 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 do. The more you know. So. World War I happened, and basically, the way I understand it, is everyone was at fault. There was no good guy, bad guy. Everyone was the asshole. Like, if all the countries involved in World War I took to the Am I the Asshole subreddit and asked, the, there would be a resounding, you were the asshole. Although I'm, I'm sure there's some fucking like incels who are going to side with one person or another. But at the end of the day, everyone was the fucking asshole. And a bunch of poor working people had to die for elite, rich, uh, overly rich, overly powerful fucks to, you know, have their squabbles and play their games as, as war always is. Uh, usually. So at the end of World War I, um, Germany got screwed over. Although at this time, Germany was like a series of states, I think. It was like separate states, and some of it was ruled under Prussia. They all had different identities. Right. And, and basically, um, I think it had something to do with the Versailles Treaty. So let's look that up. Versailles. If you're from Ohio. Treat. What does that mean? It means that we do have a place in Ohio that is Versailles. Oh. And it is spelled like Versailles. The Treaty of Versailles was the most important of the peace treaties that brought World War I to an end. The treaty ended the state of war between Germany and the Allied powers. Um, so basically, everyone was the asshole and they all said, well, this is Germany's fault, although it really wasn't at all. Uh, they just all took it out on Germany and Germany experienced hyperinflation so basically, they experienced a massive, horrible, great depression. And also part of and as a result, um, a lot of uh, political turmoil and confusion at the time. So they were not in a good shape at the time. Kind of like how the U.S. was in the Great Depression or how kind of how, how we are right now, where a lot of people are out of work, a lot of people can't afford housing, a lot of people are hard up, um, there's a lot of political unrest. A lot unrest, of finger blaming. A lot of uh, finger pointing. Yeah, oh yeah, finger, finger blaming. blaming. You were thinking finger banging like it's, that dude was doing to his um, his torso thing. Blame James for showing me smut. <laughs> if that's not a fucking pervy <laughs> laugh, I don't know what is. <laughs> um, so, yeah, they were in a very difficult situation and the German people were experiencing a lot of hardship and discomfort and uh, their lives were not easy. And there's a thing that tends to happen when a bunch of people's lives, when their material conditions, that is, 
uh, their ability to feed and house themselves and clean themselves and be able to afford things, material conditions. When a bunch of people's material conditions are very poor, people want to figure out why their lives are shit. Yeah. And sometimes that ends up in a lot of those people pointing fingers at other people, blaming them for their problems. But a lot of the time, and this is due to a lot uh, uh, generations and generations, eras and eras of indoctrination and propaganda that keeps poor working peasant folk uh, like you and I that keeps us pointing fingers at each other instead of pointing fingers at the people who really are responsible and who are also are the source uh, of our fucking poor material conditions. People stealing our money and all that shit. You're hoarding money. Um, and that would be uh, like the, the people with such massive wealth and elite condition uh, uh, connections and such like that. And I'm not talking about like the Illuminati or weird cult shit. I'm talking like the Jeff Bezoses of the world. I think people right now in America are aware of this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Aware that the fucking system ain't working for them. And that a lot of the people running the system are just kind of fucking ransacking everything. Before the whole shit house falls apart. Yeah, they're making sure they get theirs. Hmm? What's that? They're making sure they get theirs. Yeah, they're making sure they get theirs. Um, so, going back to Germany, people were experiencing very difficult living conditions. And, um, and that kind of... And, and also at the time, this is the early 1900s, so... Uh, industrial industrialization is rather new, but it is growing at a rapid pace. Do you know what industrialization is or was? It was like the expansion of technologies and cities where pollution became really high, exploitation of workers really high. Yeah. Children. Working. And by technologies, you mean like machines and stuff like that. Uh, and Which put farmers and manual laborers kind of in a tough spot because it's cheaper to have a machine and do repairs on it than human beings. So, um, so there was a lot of change going on at the time. They just got out of a war. The Germans just got out of a war, World War I. Rough living conditions, rapid industrialization, rapid cultural change. A lot of new things were happening. And for some people, uh, they felt scared by the change. Is it, uh, does that still happen today? Yes. Things changing beyond someone's control things changing from the way they were when someone was a child. Yeah. It's part of life is change. But are some people kind of scared of that change? And do some people try to stop that change from happening and lash out, say react to it? Yes. Reactionaries. Yes. Well, there was a reactionary movement in Germany uh, and Austria around that area around the time of little before World War One, and then it really picked up after, like during and after World War I, uh, because people were looking for meaning and answers to all their pain and suffering. So, enter the Volkisch movement. Uh, in German, it is the Volkisch Bewegung. Yeah, I wrote out the pronunciation and phonetics. Um, in English, it pro 
it roughly means the people's movement. Volk, Volks, V-O-L-K, F-O-L-K. Like Volkswagen is... The, the people's car? The people's car or the people's vehicle. Mm-hmm. Um, so what was the Volkish movement? Uh, the Volkish Bewegung. It was a German ethnic and nationalist, let me repeat that, it was a German ethnic and nationalist movement that was active from the late 1800s throughout the Nazi era. And it is important to note here the German unification that happened in 1871 under the Prussian minister, President Otto von Bismarck. Have you heard that name before, Otto von Bismarck? Yes. Uh, that's where uh, that hip hop artist got his name, Bismarcky, Otto von Bismarck. Well, let's not even talk about Franz Ferdinand then. Okay. What about Franz Ferdinand? He's you know, the one that kind of he got assassinated, and right. it was kind of like the. They say that was like the trigger for World War One. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Otto von Bismarck um, he was a Prussian Prussian minister president, um, and. The German unification that like culminated in 1871, uh, it was a move to liberate the, what I mentioned earlier was the separate German states. Because there was no, at the time, like Germany as we know it today. Uh, because basically the area was politically um, still working itself out of um, the feudal system. So the borders were divided still upon like feudal lines. Um, but we were moving more into, and there was capitalism in during feudalism, but, uh, it didn't, it wasn't really, it wasn't like the prime drive for politics or what is called the political economy. Um, it, over time, uh, as we got closer to present day, that's when capitalism became the main drive for our current political economic system. Uh, because your economic policies are intrinsically linked to your political policies and vice versa hence political economy as far as i know it i might be fucking wrong um sounded right to me sounds good i mean why the fuck else would it be called political economy so uh at the time there was a bunch of different german states all right um well this german unification was a was a way uh of the it was a way for the german people and all these separate states to form a sort of solidarity um even though a lot of it maybe all of it i'm not sure was under prussian hegemony and part of that unification and a lot of it had to do with the uh prussian leader or whatever the fuck his name was uh, it was a way to get out of Napoleon's French hegemony. Uh, hegemony or hegemony, however you want to say it, um, is basically a, a person, party, or system, or rule um, that reigns supreme. It calls the shots. So when you hear about a hegemonic power, that's someone, that's a power that runs the fucking scene. Um <clears throat> so Napoleon had hegemony over France and over the uh, territories that France invaded and wrested through violence. Um, and then the Prussian dude, oh, Otto von Bismarck, duh. <laughs> Otto von Bismarck um, drove them out. And also at the same time, the German people in all these separate German states uh, banded together um, because that's what has to happen when you're facing a hegemonic power is you have to form, uh, you have to organize and create solidarity, yeah, solidarity, solidarity to fight the hegemonic power, kind of like workers' unions. Um, so 
yeah, they drove out the French and they had this new sense of like, you know, we're not just these separate feudal states anymore. We are all Germans. And part of the Volkish movement um, was not just solidarity, but also to help create that sense of solidarity uh, was the either creation or rebirth of um, myths, you know, old German myths and old German lifestyle. Um, so they erected this idea of like blood and soil. The, the Volkisch Bewegung inspired this uh, one body metaphor, the Volkskörper, the people's body, Volkskörper. Um, and the idea of naturally grown communities in unity. Uh, I don't know what the fuck I meant by that. Uh, it was also characterized by... Oh, oh yeah, this is because I copied it from Wikipedia. Uh, it was characterized by organicism, organicism, racialism, populism, agrarianism, romantic nationalism, and as a con as a consequence of growing exclusive and ethnic connotation, um, anti-Semitism, uh, and this really picked up in 1900s, the early 1900s onward. So basically, um, the uh, help me out with this. From, from what I've researched here, because you're going to have to help me out with what you researched. So basically... I kept mine short. Yeah. Uh, so maybe if I just keep reading this. The Volkish movement was not a homogenous set of beliefs, but rather a, quote, uh, variegated or variegated subculture, end quote, that rose in opposition to the socio-cultural changes of modernity, the, quote, only common denominator, end quote, to all Volkish theorists was the myth of a, quote, national rebirth inspired by the reconstructed traditions of ancient Germans. This rebirth would have been achieved by either Germanicizing Christianity or by rejecting any Christian heritage that existed in Germany in order to revive pre-Christian Germanic paganism. It was part of a... So, the Volkish movement was part of a wider conservative revolution. Uh, the German national neoconservative movement that grew in prominence during the Weimar Republic... Um, existed in the years between the end of World War I and the Nazi era. Um, another part of the Volkisch movement was that it was linked with the German mystical movement. So it was kind of like a subset. So there was the conservative revolution that was happening kind of just around, I guess, the world probably, um, but especially in Europe, and a sub- part of that broader movement was the Volkisch Bewegung, and then a sub-part of that was German mystical movement, which I believe would be linked to German romanticist movement. Yeah. Um, and so part of the things they did was like they rejected rapid industrialization, uh, sort of a popular nostalgia and reactionary movement in response to political unrest, poor material conditions, and the basic fear of progress and newness. That relates to my note. Okay, let's hear it. It all really started with the unification. Yeah. And before you said before that, there were clear distinctions between the religions and different groups. And I'm guessing between the Regions. the various German states. Yes. Um, and People so had their own identities. Their, and their own religions. Yeah. yeah. And the German unification was the idea of like, you yeah, no, 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 no. We're all one. We are all part of a special breed. Except those that, that aren't. We'll get to that. We are all part of a special breed, 
and we share a common history with our ancient, uh, our German ancestors, like the old, uh, what would have been called barbarians by the uh, Roman Empire, right? Yes. Um, and I think I need to take a water break, so we'll be right back. We'll get we'll get back to it. And we're back. We left off talking about the uh, Volksstagbewegung, the People's Movement. Now, there were some particularly uh, influential people in the movement, wouldn't you say? Yes. Um, there was one really popular dude in particular. What was his name? Guido von Liszt. Guido von Liszt? Guido von Liszt. Well, tell me about him. He was born in 1848 to an upper middle class Roman Catholic family in Austria, in Vienna. So we've got a we've got a uh, Austrian papist. Yes, we do. Idolater, Mary worshiper. Okay. Yeah, but the thing was, he claimed that he didn't believe in it very early on, and he really wanted to become an artist or a scholar, but his dad was like, no. You're going to follow in my leather daddy footsteps. What? What? Being a leather man. He was the leather goods man. What? You mean he sold leather goods? Yes, he like sold Like he had a business goods. selling leather goods? Yes, he wasn't a leather daddy. He wasn't but, a leather daddy. But, but he, he was, was a leather He's daddy. a leather man. <laughs> but after his dad passed away, he ended up inheriting the leather business. But he was like, hmm, I'm going to get rid of it. Wait. So his dad was like... Guido. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Jabroni. Yeah. Jabroni, I'm dying. I need you to carry in my footsteps. Guido, I need you to become a leather man. It's true. And Guido was like, he took it on, and then he was like, wait, my leather daddy's dead. I don't have to do what he says. I'm going to go be an artist, right? Yeah, and, you know, he did end up writing afterwards, which didn't... In you mean case, he, he ended up writing instead of, like, painting and shit? Yeah. Okay. He focused on writing. I mean, you know, I'm sure that he probably still did paint for funsies, but mm. not very famous for that. So, yes, he did start writing as a journalist for some nationalist magazines. Wait, what? what's a nationalist? Oh, you know, nationalist. Someone that wants to unify their country. A nationalist wants more than just to unify. unify a nationalist and is like our unify and purify. Mm-hmm. Yes. Nationalists are like America first. It's putting your nation, your country, um, it, it's isolationist. Yeah. It's cutting your country off from other influences, uh, other trade, um, be it material trade or cultural trade. Trade, not like we're not going to be adopting any like Japanese kimonos in our country because we're America first. But the thing is with nationalists, it's that no nation has purely just one cultural or racial demographic. There's people from all over the place, all over the place. So generally, when people say nationalist, it's not just like our country, it's like my version of my country. Yeah. Maybe not your version of this country, but my version. I want my version to reign supreme in this country. That's nationalist. Yes. So then he got pretty popular doing that and started writing for bigger publications. They progressed and became a little bit more edgy. He started writing about... Wait, what did he write about in the first place? Like, he was just writing about... All right, so we're jumping ahead a little too fast here. When he started off writing, he was fucking poor as shit. He could have made good money being a leather man. Yeah. But he chose instead to follow his passions, writing, you know, like Norman Rockwell paintings in in words um, about just like... 
you know, not living in the city, you know, doing the rural life, uh, the, you know, the trad life, the glad life. You know, he, life. yeah, he wanted, he wanted like old traditional conservative values. None of this newfangled stuff. We don't need this industry. We don't need these, these, uh, you know, bohemians and whatever, even though he wanted to be a fucking writer and went off to be a writer. Um, so he was writing about basically like neoconservative, neo-traditionalist, also nationalist stuff. Yes. But, you know, as time progressed, he did get a little bit more edgy, started writing and being pretty vocal that he did not like the Semites. And this is this is after he got more popular. Mm -hmm. He started writing for larger publications like uh, he started out writing for smaller magazines, but bigger newspapers started picking him up. So he wasn't just some dude writing in the fucking um, opinions column anymore. The, you know, the opinions column saying like, oh, you know, I think we should just live out, live out on the farm and, you know, fucking fuck goats and shit, you know, harvest wheat and hate the Jews. Oh, you know, he that he got pretty fucking popular saying that kind of shit, like in the opinions column, and then became like a uh, staff writer in these big newspapers, right? Yes. Is that what the notes say? Yes, it does. And then that's when he started getting a lot more vocal about the anti-Semitism. Yes. Right. So by the late 1800s, 1890s, he started doing lectures about all of his anti-Semitic loves. And, and that trad life. And the trad with life. With the trad wife, which is fucking weird because, like, trad wife is a trend right now. Yeah, it's, I'm not surprised. Uh, fucking hipsters. They're all fucking Nazis. But who wasn't invited to those speeches? Speeches? You mean the plays? Or, no. Uh, lectures. Well, he did lectures. So he was writing in these newspapers, and he got more and more popular much like Jordan Peterson, and started doing lectures on the trad life and anti-Semitism. And Jews were not allowed at these things. And also, had he started writing plays yet? He'd been writing plays. No, he, he staged plays. Oh, he was staging. He, he didn't write plays until later. Okay. You got to read the notes. Okay. So here, I already we're read. at 1890s. He started doing lectures yeah, about the shit plays. he had been writing about. This is when he also, he started writing plays here. And these plays were staged. And the Jews were explicitly not allowed to attend those plays. Perfect. So he and his chick. They created the Danubian Literary, Literary Society. Danube, like as in the the Blue Danube, Danube River? Mm -hmm. Okay. Which actively encouraged German nationalists in neo-romantic literature. They talked about ancient Germans, how they were forced to adopt like these new Christian religions. And, and about how Jews suck. Yeah. <laughs> he really hated the Jews. So the thing with like Germans, ancient Germans being forced into Christianity is that's what the ancient Roman Empire did to the quote unquote barbarians is they forced Christianity on them after Emperor Charlemagne adopted Christianity made the Holy Roman Empire because the Roman Empire before that was polytheistic. Um, and I've actually been to the was the Parthenon in Rome. Yeah, I've been there. I've Me seen. Too. I've seen the Parthenon. I worshipped the gods, even though I was raised Catholic, but not anti-Semitic, Semitic, Semite, Semitic. So then, not long after that, like he he was just like fucking. He he was like the intellectual dark web. He's like fucking Sam Harris. They're like, oh, this dude's like. <laughs> he's pretty fucking exclusive and smart and cool and we're gonna lift him up and he hates the Jews and we hate the Jews so he was like a fucking celebrity in the Austrian pan-German movement right part of that neoconservative movement yeah right 
And then something happened to him in 1902, and he experienced like a pretty radical change in personality. What happened? Well, he was starting to get a little old at this time, had some cataracts that needed to be removed, and he went blind for 11 months. Wait, he got cataract surgery and they fucking left him blind for 11, for the all but one month of a year? You know, um, can't say that medical medical procedures of the past were great. You know, I bet he blamed that on the Jews. I bet he blamed it on, like, what's the bris tool where they oh, cut geez. off the tip of the penis? I bet they, he was like, they used the bris tool on my Christian, hating, Christian eyes. And, uh. But yeah, so while he was blind... He started to have visions and started questioning things. And the visions were of runes. And he was like, I don't know, how did the Germanic language even come about? And like, how did they use the runes? And then when his vision did come back in that, you know, after the 11 months, he ended up writing a manuscript about it. (laughs) (laughs) Which is a pretty... So he went blind for a year, had some fucking visions, and then he was like, yo, people got to know about this. And he wrote it out into a manuscript. Yeah. Continue. So, yeah, he just wanted people to know about his truth. Well, okay, it was more than that. Yeah. You can read the notes. I wrote them so they can be read on okay. here. But yeah, he wrote a manuscript that detailed what he deemed to be the proto-language of the Aryan race, the knowledge of... Wait, the what? You just blew... The what race? The proto-language. The what race? Proto-language. Aryan race? Yeah, the Aryan race. That's the first time we've heard that term. Aryan? Oh, yeah. Proto-language is not a fucking race, man. (laughs) Well, you know, you got to start somewhere. So the knowledge of the language and these runes, he claimed, came to him in the visions while he was blind. He claimed to have gained secret occult knowledge of these runes and language and the meaning of it all. Just saying. Ancient alien (laughs) theorists. (laughs) Ancient (laughs) astronaut theorists suggest... (laughs) He even, like, he didn't just write a manuscript. Like, he made a whole fucking graph of these runes that he saw, and he linked them up with other, like, Viking runes and, you know, Germanic tribal runes, and linked it up with the fucking Zodiac, and he mixed in, like, Kabbalism and other occult schools of thought. Uh, He mixed this all together and put it in a nice, neat... Aryan bag. And so conservative people from the nationalist movement thought it was phenomenal. They loved it. They thought the shit was fire. Even though some of his contemporaries said that what List had done was uh, pretty much bullshit pseudoscience. A monumental exercise in pseudoscience. So... Um, this, that was like in the early 1900s, but he had a little ways to go. Like he lived on into World War One, right? Yep. And during World War One, he claimed that Austrians and Pan-Germans would become the victors of the world knowledge that he got with that secret occult knowledge and, you know, all of the things that he knows. And then he died of lung inflammation. He had a fat lung and died a blowhard died of having a fat lung. It's true. So, considering uh, List's ideology, uh, there was one particular thing, because we mentioned he was, like, putting together all this occult shit. If there was one religion, it, like, he, he rejected... He, I mean, he was raised Catholic, but he rejected it because Christian Christendom was forced on the German people. So he took up this stuff called Wotanism. Uh, af- it's a religion based around this god named Wotan. W-O-T-A-N. Or, 
in Norway, it would be known as Odin. It's true. So Odinism, Warden, Odin. Because there was some links between the Vikings and the ancient Germans and the Puddin Pops. Well, I mean, yeah. And so, um, well, that religion played a pretty big part in this thing called Ariosophy, which he kind of helped create. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that next, but sort of uh, List's general sort of worldview was that the world that we live in is one of de degeneracy. It's a degenerate place. And he believed, he truly believed that the source of the degeneracy of the modern Western world was a result of Antifa, super soldiers, and left-wing extremists. Oh, I mean... Uh, it was the result of a conspiracy organized by a secret organization known as the Great International Party, a belief that was greatly influenced by anti-Semitic conspiracies. Mm, it was a, an, a, a Jewish elite, Jewish Illuminati of elite coastal liberal Democrats trying to you know, take down our God, the orange one, the darn Cheeto in chief, drunk. But yes. But he also believed that uh, the Aryan or Ario German race would defeat this great threat to tradition. And uh, it would defeat its enemies and become great leaders of the world they would create a new golden traditional age under the Ario german empire so i'm i want to hold on i gotta grab my phone to read some notes there's a popular left-wing streamer called vosh you may have heard of him v-a-u-s-h i think um, he, he, he reminds me of some annoying fucking basement dwelling D&D &D dudes, but, uh, he's got a pretty good understanding of things. And, uh, I, I, I stole some notes, uh, from something he was going off on that I'm going to share here. Right wing populism which is very much like the uh, um, the people's movement, the neoconservative movement in the late 1800s through the Nazi era. That is right-wing populism. And something we're seeing now, too, which is like talking to the people, but it's from a right-wing bent. Yeah. Right-wing populism is fascism. If you're a mass of, quote, ordinary people, quote, whose problems are, are, quote, all the darkies in your country stealing all your jobs, the feminism ruining your women, end quote, you are going to turn toward institutional solutions that will address these, quote unquote, systemic issues. Right-wing populism is a broad social reaction to progress. They want the trad life, the way things used to be. It was great. It used to be great, and we want it to be great again. So every time we see right-wing populism manifest in this country, and it has in the United States, it has. Um, Multiple times. It is either fully fascist or fascist-leaning. And so... We had a right-wing populist movement at the same time as Hitler. This is true. In res this was in response to the Great Depression. They were Nazis. By the way, one of the divisions called themselves America First. Um, they were sympathetic. Also, they like filled out Madison Square Garden with the big Nazi party they had. 
um, they were sympathetic to Hitler and his claims because the right-wing popular mythos plays out the same way every single time. The idea is that our country was once glorious, the group of people who deserve to have power, which invariably always turn out to be white men, once had power, but it has been robbed of us by cultural Marxists and by academics and by feminists and by Jews and by immigrants, etc. And we must return to that former glory by adulating and by celebrating and by empowering our demographic above all others. We have to curtail immigration to keep our country pure. We have to engage in economic protectionism so we're no longer reliant, reliant on other countries for our imports and exports. We need to turn our country into an insular, isolationist working horse for demographic power. It plays out that same way every fucking time. It's us. It's our small group. And there's, in Italy, there's gypsies threatening our way of life. We have to get rid of them. That's fascist thought. And this is a big fucking thing that I will expound upon more as this series continues. And I will also address some popular misconceptions <laughs> that some people have that fascism and socialism are essentially the same. They are not. I remember one time one dude tried to tell me that, uh, you know, well, Nazis were the first socialists. They call themselves the National Socialist Workers Party. Well... They did construct some social programs, but the thing is, those social programs were intended just for their small group of people, which is antithetical to socialism. The goal of socialism and socialist programs and policies, those are meant for everyone, regardless of your race, yada, yada, yada. So... Going back, this dude, Von Liszt, helped with creating this thing called Ariosophy. Um, but first, I want to address the weird word we encountered earlier. What the fuck are Aryans anyway? So here are my notes. A, the Aryans uh, are a historical race concept not a fact not an evidence thing but it's a concept a theory that developed in the late 1800s it describes a uh, so arian wait a second i'm i'm getting ahead of myself here let me just read my notes and then i'll try to fix if i fucked anything up it's a historical race concept that developed in the late 1800s. It describes a specific group of original speakers of the Indo-European language of a distinct group or subgroup of Caucasians. Um, oh, no, no, no. That's right. I was right. That's what the, the Aryan myth became, that it was like a special group of whites, the special whites. Um, so... Indo-European languages are a large family of languages that came from Western Eurasia, and it evolved into many languages uh, in Europe, in modern-day Europe, India, and Iran. Uh, the word Aryan is a term used as a self-designation by Indo-Iranian people in ancient times. In other words, uh, the Sanskrit, Sanskrit, the Sanskrit word area, the Sanskrit word area is an old, old, old original word for people of what is now present day Iran, um, and an ethonym for the ancient, ancient, 
ancient Iranian people or uh, the really old, old, old Persians. The word area itself meant honorable, respectable, noble. So basically, it's what the ancient Iranians or ancient Persians called themselves, the noble ones, the respectable ones, the honorable ones. Now, in the 1700s, anthropologists, uh, um, the oldest two anthropologists, the oldest known of the Indo-European languages were those of the Indo-Iranians. So Indo-Iranian language falls under the umbrella of Indo-European languages. Uh, the Indo-Iranians called themselves Aryans, the noble ones. So, in 1700s, anthropologists, or the equivalent thereof, uh, they figured that Romans, Greeks, Germans, Balts, and Celts were Aryans as well, because they figured, well, if they're the noble ones, well, they're white. And if, if it's like the most ancient language, then that means like they were pretty fucking advanced. And I think, you know, I'm white and I think I'm pretty awesome and all the other white people I know are pretty awesome. So well, we they must about, have been white. We could talk about anthropology in a couple. Okay. So um, as far as anthropologists knew, all of these people, the Celts and everyone else, they all came from the same root of the Aryans. Uh, now, in the 1800s, in the school of schools of physical anthropology and scientific racism, which I still fucking see videos for on YouTube today. So do you know what physical anthropology and or scientific racism is? Well, physical anthropology, yes. sorry, physical anthrop anthropology <laughs> is going to be based on physical attributes given to people. Okay. Of a certain group. So, you know, James always says I have a smushy head. Uh, the idea is that what people used to do and what people still do, some people, is like they would use calipers to measure the size of the skull of um, a person with black skin compared to the size and shape of a skull of a person with white skin. And they would say... Oh, well, uh, this person from Somalia has got a different shaped skull than me, and it's more ape-like. So I don't think they're as evolved as me. You know, I'm, I'm white. I've got a more evolved head. It was using pseudoscience. It was manipulating science and numbers completely unfounded on actual scientific method uh, to reinforce pre-existing um, ideals and racist ideas. Yep. So, um, where was I? So, the people that were studying physical anthropology and scientific racism in the 1800s, um, they, to them, the term Aryan race, they used the term Aryan race um, as a further misapplication uh, for all people descended of proto-Indo-Europeans. So basically, the people in, you know, Central, like, Europe proper, the white Europe, they were the Aryans, yet again, reinforcing, kind of like what Ben Shapiro does. He starts with his, his fifis, even though he says he works, he's like a champion of, like, he says, facts don't, facts don't care about your feelings. And he thinks he uses, you know, crushes people with logic and reason. But his arguments are very easily dismantled because what he does and what a lot of other of the fucking intellectual dark web types like fucking Jordan Peterson, what they do is they use their predetermined ideology and prejudices and then instead of creating an argument to reach a reasonable, logical conclusion, they just, they have 
the end that they want, and then they will create an argument and bend an argument and manipulate uh, an argument to fit their pre-existing ideas, feelings, their feelings. Um, and that's what these people were doing uh, by calling, you know, saying the Aryan race was just people descended of Proto-Indo-Europeans, uh, which were considered a specific subgroup of Caucasian peoples commonly believed to have come from southeastern present-day Russia and Ukraine. Oh, but it doesn't stop there, baby. Oh, no. By the late 1800s, the idea of just who the Aryan race was became even more twisted, but nonetheless commonly used and regarded around the white world, even across the Atlantic. It was applied uh, to only describe the ancient Germanic and Nordic peoples, Northern Europeans, yep. Scandinavians, Germans, and and Denmarkians, because Denmark's not Danes. part of the Danes. They're called Danes. Uh, Danish cookies are delicious, by the way. They are. So, now we understand what the fuck an Aryan is. And this is something that it took me a minute in researching to really wrap my head around. It's the idea that trying to use, like, sane logic and reason with the things these people do and the ideas they come up with, you cannot use sane logic and reason because there is no sane logic and reason. It is all pseudoscience. It's an actual rejection of science. Part of these um, pro-neo-Christian, neo-traditionalist nationalist movements were not just to reject modernity, but to reject the sciences all together because they considered the sciences and academics as a whole, uh, academia as a whole, to be part of an elite system, which was, of course, inherently linked to the great uh, elite Jewish conspiracy. <laughs> Fucking insane. So then, here we come to Ariosophy. Did I write some extra notes on Ariosophy, or was that just you? I think maybe I just wrote about the Aryans, and then you I wrote... I would say to, that we should come back to it. Uh, you, you cover Ariosophy real quick, because then we can get into closer to the shit that went down. Okay. So, describe Ariosophy and Arminism, and we can call it quits. Okay. So, what is... Ariosophy. Uh, so, osophy would be the study, study or to learn, and then Ario would be Arians. Yep. So, the study of Arians. Yep. Ariosophy. Yes. It was first noted by Jorg Lanz von Liebenfels. Jorg Lanz von Liebenfels. Okay. So, this was a good way to to show the interpretation of Christianity. Like, it showed the highlight of the struggle between the Aryan race and the savage, which was literally anyone else that was not an Aryan. <laughs> so it's good versus this primitive, bestial evil. Another part of fascism is that it always creates a great drama. But continue. That'll be covered. But yes... We, they believed that uh, through segregation, eugenics, and genocide that the world would be more pure and get back to God. Wait, repeat that for me? You know, all of the bad things that... No, 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 repeat the details of what you just said. Segregation, eugenics, and genocide in the world could be more pure. It would make the world more pure and get back to God. So it would rid us of the others so that our people the pure ones can stay pure and have hegemony yes and we can thank fringe pop for that one interesting yeah and then what is arminism 
So, Armin is... Ow. The ideal of free will over predetermination. So, you know, it's the responsibility of man over, like, God and freedom. You know, you need to have the man is responsible. The person is responsible in order to get it. Free will over predetermination. Another feature of fascism, which is that it is up to you to pick yourself up. Your individualism, not your individuality, but your individualism. Pick yourself up by your bootstraps. Fight hard for your people. For we all are, are all one, and we are all products of this soil, and we share blood, and we are a singular organism scattered into many. We are the great Aryans. And uh, it just gets more fucking crazy and dramatic from there. Um, you said you had something to say about anthropology? Oh, no, I want it to be a whole episode. All right. Uh you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at James J. Asher. Um, help me, please, become a patron. No, no, don't help me become a patron. Help me by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash that thing with James. There will be links in the show notes and or description. Thank you for tuning in. And we will be back soon with more details about New Age Nazis. Have a good night. <sighs> Bye.